Don't you just love Jesus? Don't you just love serving him and lifting him high and singing his praise and rejoicing in all that he is? It's just a wonderful thing to do. And we get to do this together. Aren't we, we're glad we're just not solo somewhere out doing this until Jesus returns. We get to do it together. What a privilege that is. And I love you so much. And um, <clears throat> I want to ask your permission to... Um, Step into your living room today, okay? Um, let me put it this way. I'm going to ask your permission to step into your inner room today. I'm going to ask permission for you to let me, through the word and through the work of the Holy Spirit, to speak into some deeper places in your heart. We've been spending a lot of time, and I know you've appreciated it as much as I have, going through the parables and personalizing the parables and seeing what, what kind of kingdom people God wants us to be and how we need to change in order to be like that. And we're kind of rolling right into starting with last week. Wasn't it awesome that Kaya was here last week? Just did a fantastic job stirring our hearts for the Lord. As we personalize the gospel, as we take a look at this thing of what is the gospel and we're going to work on that today. And then next week, we're going to actually get really practical with it. Okay, what do we do with it? But today, we're going to talk about the thing itself and what our responsibility is. And I'm just asking you, will you give me permission to like, speak into maybe some places that have needed to be um, shaken al alert and, and shaken awake in you that might have been asleep for a while? Would you give me permission to do that today? Good. I'm going to attempt to preach a sermon on six words out of Matthew chapter 13. If you want to take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 13, it's another parable that we're going to look at, and I'm going to just, the whole entire sermon is going to be wrapped around these six words in Matthew 13, 3. You ready? ready. Here they are. A sower went out to sow. The whole sermon is going to be based on those six words, a sower went out to sow. Now, I'd like to introduce you to my happy place. Okay, and um, when, I, when I go here, I'm like a little kid where I'm all excited, okay? And I know you'll judge me when I show you this, but this is my happy place right here. Why is that so funny? Have I already showed this to you before? How many of you know this is my happy place? Well, I'm going to talk about it some more because it is my happy place. Um, how many of you don't know that this is my happy? You didn't know until now that this is my happy place. Oh, okay. I'm talking to you people. Okay. So my happy place is this is fresh sourdough bread right here. And there is, you guys, how many of you know that there is nothing better, especially out of the oven? Now, this isn't right out of the oven. It was last night, you know, but how many of you know that this right here is like super special? It wouldn't be super special without Jif peanut butter. <laughs> Not Peter Pan. Not Meyer. <laughs> and not just grape jelly. Welch's grape. How many of you agree with me? Agree with me, okay? Now I know a bunch of you are gonna say no, strawberry jam is my gig, you know, by right here, but and I love strawberry jam too, but there is something very special. Not just about grape jelly but Welch's grape jelly. And this is the coolest invention of all. This little flat blade thing that you can just, it, you don't even have to use a spreader, it just spreads itself. Look at that, can you see that? A beautiful, beautiful, wonderful creation right here. Now, some of you are like, no, yeah, that's great. I mean, nothing, nothing better than a good piece of bread and some peanut butter and jelly. But you gotta understand that 
This is so special to me. When you get done with dinner and you want a dessert, you want something sweet after dinner, you probably go for, how many chocolate people do we have in here? You go for chocolate. Look at that. How many chocolate? How many like, you know, I want some ice cream after dinner. I just want some ice cream. Okay, or I want some, you know, you can name it, whatever it is. When you're going to the dessert table at like a buffet and you're going to the dessert table, do you know where I'm going? To the bread basket. Because I could eat all day, like all day long, this could be my dessert. This could be, because this is my happy place. Who can I bless with this? I'm going to bless you with my happy place. I want you to experience that. We're all going to sit here. (laughs) You know what came to my mind as I'm preaching on this, okay, because we're six little words. A sower went out to sow. Here's the deal. That phrase is like intimately connected to my happy place. Because had a sower not gone out to sow, I would not have flour to make my bread, I would not have peanuts to make my butter, and I would not have fruit to make my jam. And I would be very sad (laughs) if that was the case. Directly connected are these things. This phrase out of of God's word that Jesus spoke, a sower went out to sow, is directly connected to my happy place and what a dull boy I would be, and what a sad boy I would be had a sower not gone out to sow to make this possible for me. I did not go out and sow the wheat. I did not go out and sow the peanuts, and I did not go out and sow the grapes. Somebody had to be that person in order to make my happy place happen. Now, when Jesus made up this story, he knew that his hearers would come to the same conclusion about their happiness as I did. He knows his audience, and he knew that his hearers in this agrarian society that they lived in would relate the importance of the words, a sower went out to sow. And before we go any further, let me remind you what a parable is. I know you're like, I know, we already know, Phil, we've heard it for eight weeks. I'm gonna remind you one more time what a parable is. It's important that you understand that a parable is a common word picture that casts light on a profound, a profound spiritual truth, a profound spiritual lesson. Okay, so though the story is made up, the lesson is real. Is it good, brother? Are you enjoying that thoroughly? My mouth is watering watching you eat that. I love you, man. That's so good. All right. So this is a common word picture that Jesus knew everyone that would be listening would instantly be able to relate to, and then Jesus would reveal a heavenly truth about God and his kingdom. And so it's important that we be those recipients to hear the truth today, a sower went out to sow. He didn't say a warrior went out to fight. He didn't say a scholar went out to discover. He didn't say a rabbi went out to teach. He simply started his parable, a sower went out to sow, knowing that his hearers would connect this with their everyday lives, and they would understand, like me, that their very existence would hang on the significance of this action. See, bread and grain was a central part of their life. It was at the very center of their lives And had a sower not gone out to sow, that part of their lives, a very integral part, would be taken away from them, and their lives would not continue if the sower had not gone out to sow. They would understand that this action, let me say it like this, is the most important task related to the survival of their lives on earth. Now, that's just the physical story that he's telling. When you relate now and apply the spiritual or kingdom application to it, I have it written on the screen for you. This is what we learn. Spiritual sowing stands in the same relation to the spiritual world as the natural sowing occupies in the natural world. Now, here's what that means. Life or death, heaven or death, or hell, 
happiness or misery, salvation or damnation is dependent upon this question that we're gonna ask today, will sowers go out to sow? Where would I be today? Where would you be today, Christian, who spent the whole morning lifting high the name of Jesus and singing all about his praise and singing all about his wonders and singing all about the resurrection in his, in his, and the life that is in Jesus Christ, singing all about the release of the chains that have been hanging on to you and holding you back. Where would you be, Christian, if a sower did not go out to sow? Have you ever thought about that? We sing that one song, I love it. Where would I be without you? Where would I be without your love? But we need to add, where would I be had a sower not gone out to sow? How appreciative are we that someone along the line thought it was interesting enough, thought it was obedient enough to be to the Lord, thought it was important enough to sow the gospel into your life? How awesome was it that in 1976 that there was a group of people that had a heart for teenagers and they decided to pour themselves in and the counselors came and were trained and, and the administration all got together and decided, let's put a program together that Phil Byers is going to be at and he's going to sit in a meeting where he's going to hear the clear, concise gospel of Jesus Christ and that day he's going to give his heart to the Lord. How thankful am I that there was a group of people that loved teenagers enough to put a camp together and to put a curriculum together that would speak into me and sow the word of God into my life. Can you relate to that? What a question. This is silly, even though it's meaningful to me. This is silly. That the sower has to get this in order to make my happy place. But listen, in an eternal happy place that you and I need to have in our life, every single person needs to have this eternal happy place in the Lord is dependent upon a sower going out to sow. If you have your notes, you can go to the first question that we're going to ask. What was a sower doing? Well, that's easy, Phil. He was sowing. We might have some kids in here. Kids, do you know what sowing is? Like a sower went out to sow. A sower went out to sow. Is that what we're talking about? No, we're not. We're not talking about that, okay? A sower went out to sow. This is what they did, okay? They went out with seed to sow seed, okay? Sowing. Um, is different. In fact, your Bible might say um, a farmer went out to plant. That's what your Bible might say, okay? That's not the true meaning of what this is. This is a sower went out to sow. You know what the, what what the, um, I think we have it right here. Here's what a sowing means. It means to scatter or to broadcast. Planting is quite different. Planting is, I'm going to go out. It has, for us especially, like I'm going to take a couple of seeds and I'm going to um, plant the seed. Okay, let's go ahead and plant the seed. And then we're gonna push the soil down over the seed and then put a little water on it and we're gonna plant the seed. Okay, that is not what we're talking about here. We're talking about, are you ready? <laughs> what would you have done if I had just taken a handful and just sewn it, sewn it over you? You'd be okay with that? Yeah, well... Jeff wouldn't because the maintenance department would have to pick it up and clean it up. This is what they did. They, they, they had a strapped on a bag or some kind like this and they would broadcast the seed. They would cast the seed. They would sow the seed. Sow it out there. Sow it out there. This is what we're talking about. A sower went out to sow. Broadcasting the gospel. Broadcasting the good news. Broadcasting the seed of the gospel. Now, you know what's really interesting is that somebody, I was, I was talking to Mike, actually, because we were looking, I was looking for something like this that I could show you on this, and he said, well, I have something. I can't wait to show this to you. Look at this thing. 
This is a seed broadcaster. Somebody got tired of doing this, and they actually went to their garage or their basement or something. Somebody went out there and invented. It's called a fiddle broadcaster. Watch this. I could do this all day long. That is the coolest thing that somebody went to their basement or their garage and said, hmm, let me put some sticks and stones, not stones, but let's put some metal together. Let's put something together that will help me, listen to me, that will help me broadcast more seed and at a faster rate and so that I can cover more area with the seed as I broadcast. This is a sower who figured this out. Oh, that God, how happy would the Lord be if God's people became sowers like that, not just being faithful to sow the seed, but coming up with and inventing new ways that I can get more seed out to more people and broadcast more seed even faster to a world that is dying and needing the seed of the gospel. This is what the sower, the sower went out to sow the seed. What is the seed? Look at verse 19. The word or the message of the kingdom is the seed that the sower is sowing. The seed in this passage is the gospel and the sower is broadcasting that message. And I want you to notice something else. Look again at verse three. The sower went out to sow. I think something stirred inside of him and he said, you know what, it's time to get up and go out and do what I'm called to do. It's time to get up and go out and do what I'm commanded to do. It's time to get up, let me put it this way, it's time to get up and go out and do what I am created to do. And this is where I wanna like speak into your heart a little bit. Because I love you, I want to ask the question, are there some here? You've been a member of the church, not First Baptist. You've been a member of the body of Christ. You've been a member of the church for years and years and years. And yet you've really never done anything for the Lord when it comes to sowing. Are there some that are hearing my voice? You claim to be a servant of the Lord but you have never really worked at the salvation of souls. Well, the, the Holy Spirit, if, if, if that's true of you, you need to acknowledge it, you need to admit it, and receive this word from the Holy Spirit today. Get up, it's time to go out and sow. Don't become a victim of your own circumstance. Don't become a victim to say, yeah, well, I've gone this long without it. I'm comfortable here. I'm not gonna go forth. I'm not gonna go out. That would be a huge mistake. The Holy Spirit is saying to you today, it's time. Get up and go out and sow your seed. It's time to stop being casual about the gospel, it's time to strap on the seed bag and start broadcasting the good news of salvation. Let me show you what Paul says about this. This is so critical to us understanding. In 2 Corinthians 5.19, you're gonna see it on the, on the screen here, it says this, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. So this is what God has been up to. God has been up to fixing that which has been broken by sin. Our relationship with him, all have sinned and fall short of God's glory, and the wages of our sin is death. Therefore, God came up with a plan to reconcile the lost unto himself. And his plan was Jesus Christ, who came and offered his life and sacrificed his life on a cross and then rose from the dead so that our chains of sin could be broken and so that we could be saved. This is what God is at work doing. But watch this, my friend. He gave us, who's us? 
us as those who have been saved and those who have been reconciled. He gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So he is in the business of reconciling the lost to himself and he hands to those being reconciled who have been reconciled the message of reconciliation. This is the seed of the gospel. So we are Christ's ambassadors. You could actually write in there, if you got it in your Bible or in your notes, you can actually write there, we're, we're Christ's broadcasters. That's a really good word for that. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. I want you to hear me now very clearly. You and I are going to be going home really soon. I, I want you to hear me. Some will say what I'm about to say is a classic Baptist thing. That would be an insult to what I'm about to tell you if you say that in your heart, okay? Um, this is a biblical thing that we're talking about. We're going to be going home real soon, and the Lord is going to ask us. We're going to give an account. And he's going to ask us, did you do any sowing for me? Let's talk about that. You don't want to have to reply something like this, no, Lord, but I did plenty of eating. I filled my belly with the bread of life and I feasted weekly with the congregation and I even went faithfully and gorged myself in the life group that we had and I went daily to my devotionals. I went to Bible studies as much as I could. I have pins from BSF. I've been a BSF leader and I, I have been, a, I'm not mocking that. I am not mocking that. Please hear me. But when we get to heaven, the Lord is going to say, that's great, but did you do any sowing? No, Lord, but I did a bunch of hoarding. I'm a prepper, you know. I have a whole barn full of seed. You should see it. It's awesome. Come on and look at my seed. And the Lord's going to say, I don't care about your barn full of seed. Did you go out and sow the seed? My friends, that'll be a terrible question for those of us who have never gone out to sow. The time for being comfortable is over. Is it uncomfortable to share the gospel? I'll wait till you answer that. Is it uncomfortable? Yeah. What's interesting is some of you are like, no, not, not uncomfortable at all. Others are like, yeah. And the rest of you are like, I don't want to answer that. <laughs> it's uncomfortable for me. I've been doing it my whole life. It's uncomfortable for me. It's uncomfortable to like step into that place with somebody. <clears throat> Why? This week I had the opportunity was driving into church, and there was a man sitting at the cross, just standing at the cross. He's weeping. It was very uncomfortable as I drove by. I stopped, I rolled down the window, and I said, are you okay? And he said, no. Right there, I had, I had to make a decision. <laughs> well, um, I gotta get to work. Hope this goes well for you. I could get out and, you know, your brain starts to think, you know, maybe I'm interrupting something very special. I don't want to, like, interrupt. So I could talk myself out of it. Well, if I get out, I'm going to interrupt him. So I thought to myself, well, I'm just going to go give him a hug. You might be like, well, did you know the guy? Didn't know, never seen him before in my life. Walked over to him. I gave him a hug, and I, I just said, um, I'm really sorry you're down. I don't know what you're down about. He just, started rat he just started telling me a story. And he said, I come here often. I live right across the way over here. But most of the time, because of my work schedule, I'm out here at 3 o'clock in the morning. And, I, and he says, I walk your trails, and I stop at the cross, and I go, 
What does God say to you when you're standing here? Or what do you say to him? He goes, sometimes I just stand here and cry. I said, well, has he ever spoken to you? Has he ever talked to you? And I began to walk him through what God has done for me. I didn't have some memorized thing that I laid out for him. I just started telling him how God met me and took care of my needs and what he did for me. And because he did that for me and it's real in my life, I know that he can do the same for you. Can I tell you how it happened with me? And he said, yes. And I had my wristband on and I took my wristband off and I'm going to talk about this next week. I didn't have my, one of the Bibles in my car, and I was so upset about that. But I took him through the, the wristband, and I showed him the wristband, and I, showed him, I told him about Christ. He did not receive Christ right then. Was it awkward? Was it, was it you know, like di- a little bit difficult? Yes, it totally was. But now is the time, my friends, to step outside of our comfort zones, to to stop being comfortable and go out and sow the seed. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation. Now is the time. Do you not understand that lawlessness is abounding? Do you not understand that we're getting closer and closer to the end of all things? Do you not understand that the jails are filling up Do you not understand that immorality is on the rise? We're not keeping it in check. In fact, immorality is normalizing in our world, not just in our society, in the world itself. Do you not understand that satanic activity and Satan worship is rising on the global scale? Do you not understand that there's a strong spiritual delusion that has the unsaved in a hypnotic state and only the power of the truth of the gospel can break that spell. Listen, you and I have the seed of life in us. Want a homework assignment? (laughs) Probably not. Here's something we can do, go home. Have you ever just looked yourself in the mirror and not looked at like, you know, what's not going, just looked at yourself and tried to look into your own eyes and look deep into your own heart and deep into your own soul in the mirror? It's kind of creepy to do that, but have you ever tried that? I think we all ought to go home and look in the mirror and say to ourselves, it's time to go out and sow for the master. I can't spend my whole life thinking about what I'm going to do. I've got to get out there and I've got to do it. I've got to do it right now because I might be called home real soon and my day will be over before I have sown a single handful of wheat if I don't go out to sow. Can I go a step further? The sower didn't just go out to sow. He went out. The sower went out out to sow the seed. You can't sow the seed in your living room. You won't be effective, hear me, you won't be effective if you sow in the same spot, in one little plot of ground over and over and over and over again. Doesn't mean that we shouldn't keep telling people that need to hear But some of us think that we could just stand in one spot. If you were a farmer and you stood in one spot out in your field and you just get cast and cast and cast, somebody would come along and say, you're wasting your seed. What are you doing? Move. Get it out to more people. So broadcast it to everyone that you can. If you've done the work, here's the point. If you've done the work in one place, then move on and go somewhere else and cast the seed. I'm actually asking God for a general feeling among all of us. I'm not just, I'm not just speaking to the professional sowers here or the, the, the long-termers, okay, the long-rangers in the, in the church that you know, you know how to do this. I'm talking to every single person. I am asking God 
for a feeling amongst all of us that we must go out to the vast acreage where not even one seed has been sown and take the gospel there. I'm asking God to open up our hearts and open up our minds and give us opportunities, more and more opportunities. My prayer is that God would use this body in such a way that it would be said, look, the sowers are going out to sow. Not there's a couple of them. How awesome would it be if we were a congregation? I'm not saying this in a prideful way at all, but this is my heart. Because this is God's heart, this is Christ's heart in telling us this parable for every single believer to sow the seed, to go out and sow. And so it's my prayer and it's my heart that every single one of us, as we walk out of this, it's like there's an army rising up. We sang that earlier. There's an army rising up to break every chain with the good news of the gospel and that when the church goes out, when this church goes out after every Sunday, we're all filled up with joy. We're all filled up with encouragement. We're all filled up with love for the Lord and for each other that we move out of this place and the Satan and himself and all of his demonic foe rise up and say, "Uh uh-oh, we better get to work down there. The sowers are going out to sow. How awesome would that be? Could one more than one person say something right then? How awesome would that be, right? I had a great opportunity this week to, um, spend time with Jim Cook. You remember Jim Cook from Bethesda. Jim Cook and Dean Parham, um, like almost 20 years ago, Jim wrote a curriculum for children called 99 Adventures in the Bible's Big Story. It's 99 lessons, chronological lessons about seeing Christ in the Bible for kids. It's a wonderful, wonderful book, okay? has all kinds of stuff. Well, about eight years ago, you know, we have our season of generosity, um, Linnell Smith, one of our missionaries, had this, and she wanted it um, translated, this whole thing translated into Spanish. They hadn't translated it into any language um, at that point, and they, she called up and said, well, it would be kind of great if you guys would pay to do this. And so we paid, we gave money to have this translated into Spanish, and what they just reported to me is that it's all over the place right now in, this, in the Spanish world out there, um, but specifically in Cuba, right now, there are 500 children's programs using this in Spanish, and there are 500 churches on waiting lists to get it in Spanish so that they can use it. My friends, listen to me, because we invested in someone who had a heart to share the seeds of the gospel into children and to to sow it into the kids' lives, and we were able to be part of that. Thousands and thousands of children are hearing in their own language the gospel of Jesus Christ through this simple book. And this is only one thing that has happened happening all over the world. We're getting ready to commission again, once again, our um, rock cry trip that's gonna go out. And when they go to Africa, my friends, they go to places in the bush in Africa where people have never heard the gospel. They're sowing seeds of the gospel into places and into people that have never heard. I am asking God, and I hope your heart is full of this. I am asking God that he give us many, many opportunities like that. And when we give to the Lord, these are the things that we get to invest in, into the advancement of the gospel. But as one of our pastors said to me today, there might be some that think that sowing the gospel is, I don't have to go out with the gospel and I don't have to be a sower of the seed. All I have to do is pay for it. I get to pay for the seed to go out, so I, don't, I get a buy. I don't have to go out and sow the seed. If you have ever thought that, I want to remind you of something. You didn't pay for anything. Christ paid for the seed with his life. And it's awesome. We give, and we give to opportunities that are beyond us. And it's such a wonderful thing, but it does not give us an out when it comes to the sower going out to sow. You and me. I am so upside down in my message right now. Um, Here's a good time to go to point number two and ask this question. Who was the sower? 
Well, we don't know. In some of his parables, Jesus gave us details about the person, like the prodigal son. We all kinds of details about his personal life and his past and his future and everything else that was going on. We don't know anything about this guy. Jesus didn't think it important to share anything personal about him. We don't know his name. We don't know his skin color. We don't know if he's a Jew or a Gentile. We don't know his social status or his position in the community. We don't know if he is a person of significant influence or not. Some have said, well, I know. I, I know what he is. He's a farmer. How do you know that? Because well, my Bible says that he's a farmer. Well, I hate to tell you that, this, but that word farmer is a poor um, translation of the Greek. Because Jesus, in the Greek language, is very specific to words. Jesus uses the same word to describe the act. The word is sparrow. And he uses the same word he uses to describe the act to describe the actor. Okay, so basically it's this in the Greek. The sparrow went out to sparrow. Okay, it's not a farmer went out. Some of you might say, well, and I think this is the reason. I think Jesus was like, I don't want any personal thing in here because I don't want any of my children, any of those of, who have accepted the seed of the gospel into their own hearts to be able to say, oh, well, I'm not a farmer, so this doesn't apply to me. This is a person went out, a sower, okay, a sower went out to sow. A broadcaster went out to broadcast. And you apply that to your heart, hopefully you can draw the parallels. His identity wasn't wrapped up in who he was or where he was or what he was in the past or what he hopes to be in the future. His identity is lost in his occupation. The sower went out to sow. Wouldn't you love it? <laughs> I know I would. Wouldn't you love it if people looked at you and they were like, you know what, I can't, I can't think of his name. I can't remember his name. I can't remember her name. Um, I don't really care. All I know is he's a sower of seed. Wouldn't you love it? If that's how you were known? Not anything about your past, not anything about your skill, not anything about anything other than wouldn't you love to be known in the world, especially in the kingdom? As I don't know much about them, but they're a sower of the seed. You know anybody like that? Have you known anybody like that? Do you know people like that? You can read about them in history. You can read about the Charles and John Wesleys of the world. You can read about D.L. Moody. You can read about George Whitfield and Charles Finney. And anybody know the name Billy Graham? There's a sower of the seed. How many, how many thousands, tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of people have given their lives to Christ under the broadcasting ministry of Billy Graham crusades over the years? How awesome would that be to be known? I don't know much about Billy Graham, but I know he was a preacher of the gospel. For me in my life, Kyle Martin's one of those men. I love Kyle and, Sarah and Laura and the heart that they have to equip believers to be the broadcasters of the seed. And they're going all over the world with the gospel. This is the kind of guy that he is. We took him to lunch after, after preaching last week. You know, you're hungry after you preach. So we took him out to lunch and... And we were at a restaurant, and we all got done. We had a whole pile of us, his whole team, and, and all of us were there, and we kind of walk all out, and we're waiting in the parking lot, and we're like, waiting in the parking lot, and we're waiting in the parking lot. And I'm like, well, where's Kyle? So I go back in. I walk in, and here is Kyle on his knees next to a table where there were three women sitting, and he was sharing the gospel with them. And whenever he came out, he goes, sorry, sorry to keep you guys waiting. I just got a word from the Lord that I needed to sow into that table. Wow. Terry Thompson's a good friend of mine. He's been here in our pulpit. Terry is an evangelist. He's a pastor, but he's an evangelist. And he went to this little town of Crawfordsville. They had 25 people in the church. And he goes, okay, people, we're going to fire this baby up. We're going to go share Jesus with people. We're going to go broadcast our seed into, into Crawfordsville. And we're going to see what the Lord does. 
So he went out and they just started winning souls to Jesus. And you would ask him, Terry, what are you doing out there? Aren't you a pastor? Yeah, I am. Well, what are you doing out there spending all your time coaching softball and coaching basketball and coaching soccer and being at the games and doing all this stuff? Shouldn't you be at the church studying? He would look at you and go, what's wrong with you? I'm casting seed. I'm broadcasting seed. Every opportunity I can, I'm out there to share the gospel with people. And he was winning so many people to Christ that they had like 400 brand new babies. They had like a, a, a nursery for, for new believers at their church. And, and he called me up. He goes, Phil, I'm drowning. I need some help. I need help. I, we, gotta, we have all these babies that need to be discipled. Can you come help me? And that's when Robin and I went to Crawfordsville and helped them. And help them train up these children into what is actually happening in your life. And Terry is like, keep going, Phil. You just do that. I'm just going to keep casting the seed, keep casting the seed, keep casting the seed. I love that about him. My father-in-law, Jimmy Cook, evangelist, been an evangelist his whole life. Thousands of people have come to Christ under his ministry. And he ministers into little churches. But in my own family, there are people who have come to Christ under his ministry, under his preaching, as he casts the seed and broadcasts the seed. You'll never see him not stopping to talk to somebody in the public about Jesus. My son-in-law, Davy Blackburn, is an evangelist. Do you know that the day that his wife the day after she had been shot and is lying in the intensive care unit at the hospital, before they even knew what exactly all had happened, the doctors came in and said, it's not good. She's probably not gonna make it. And Davy said, something came up inside of me and I grabbed the doctor's hand and I said, doctor, pray with me. I have to pray for you right now. And he grabbed his hand and he pulled him in and this is what he prayed. I pray that this doctor would come to know you, Lord Jesus. I pray that all the doctors and all the nurses and everyone in this hospital, that there would be a, a revival that goes through this hospital for the gospel of Jesus Christ and that many would come to faith in the Lord. This is, this is why his wife is dying on a table. This is a heart, my friends. This is a heart for the gospel. This is a, these are people that we're talking about here that they see themselves as sowers. Their identity is locked up in their occupation that they are called to. Every single one of us are like them. Don't make the mistake of saying, man, I wish I could be somebody like them. I'm not, so I'll let them do it. That's a huge mistake. And you're missing out on a huge blessing to be able to share Jesus with people. Well, I don't know if I have the biblical knowledge, Phil. I'm not sure. You know, no one, no one ever says that you have to be a seminary graduate to be able to share Jesus with somebody. All you got to, do you have a story? I'm going to fly for the next <laughs> two minutes about what was the result. I want you to notice what the sower didn't have to do. When you have read this, and you've read this in the past, I'm sure, a sower went out to sow. Had it occurred to you that he didn't have to prepare the soil? Isn't that what farmers have to do? Don't the farmers have to go out and prepare the soil before that they plant? I mean, how stupid would it be to just cast seed on the, on the hard ground, right? I mean, you gotta like till the soil, you gotta prepare the soil, right? Am I right? That makes sense to you? Okay, well, that's not what this farmer had to do. He's not a farmer. The sower did not have to sow, did not have to till up the ground. Did you know that that's not your job or mine either? Don't miss this. That work of preparing the hearts of people is solely the work of the Holy Spirit. There is no amount of effort on your part that brings salvation to a soul who has not been already visited by the Holy Spirit and had the, the soil of their hearts prepared. Let me show you this in John 6, No one can come to me, Jesus said, unless the Father who sent me draws him. There has to be a work of God in their life in order for them to come to Jesus. 
Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. Consider this reality in 1 Corinthians 1.18. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are headed for destruction. Well, why is that, Phil? Because 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 tells us that Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news, and they don't understand this message about the glory of Christ. Satan has them blinded. Satan has them bound. It takes somebody, the work of power of the Holy Spirit of God, to come along. So that's the plan. The Holy Spirit runs the blade of the plow deep into the soil of their hearts, and then he employs his sowers, you and me, to go out and sow the seed of the gospel into their souls. This is what they call a divine human cooperative that's going on in salvation. Romans 10, 14 says, how can they call on him to whom they have unless they believe in him. There's the work of the Holy Spirit right there. They can't call on him unless they believe in him. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 that it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and the faith that you receive has been given to you to believe. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. How can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? That is a cooperative right there, the Holy Spirit and the sower at the same time working, and how can they hear about him unless someone tells them there's the work of the sower? That's your work and mine. And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? This is why the scripture says, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. Faith comes from hearing, that is hearing the good news about Christ. A sower went out to sow. What was the result? If we were to read, the, continue to read, and we're not going to, um, the seed fell on the soil. They broadcast the seed, and the seed fell on the soil. Some fell on the path, and the birds ate it. Some fell on rocks, and the sun scorched it. Some fell on thorny places and had the life choked from it. But some of it fell on good soil that produced an abundant crop. Listen to me, this is so important. The weight of the result of casting your seed, of broadcasting your seed is not on you and me. The weight of the result is on the Holy Spirit of God alone. In fact, sowing is an act of faith on our part. We by faith sow the seed. We by faith tell people about Jesus knowing that we can't, there's no amount of influence or persuasion you can have on a person to bring them to salvation if the Holy Spirit isn't doing the work out ahead of you. And taking what you're actually saying and presenting and opening their hearts to be able to understand it and to receive it. We aren't to lay in our beds worrying about the seed that we have sown. In fact, if we have done our jobs and have sown our seed in the daytime, then we can sleep soundly at night knowing that God will supernaturally produce the growth in the morning sun of the next day. Amen. The only sleepless nights we should ever experience is when we have neglected to sow our seeds in the light of day. May it be said of us today, The sowers went out to sow. They went from the gathering with one resolve, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, having been redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus, they would determine to go out from this place and make known the glorious gospel and proclaim that gospel to the souls of men. May it be said of us that we are wholly committed to sowing the good seed in every place that we have the opportunity, trusting God to give us the increase and to multiply it. If you're hearing my voice today and you've never received the good seed for yourself and, um, and you're hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit calling you through this message, if there is a conviction in your heart that is the plowing work of the Holy Spirit of God into your heart and into your life, calling you to salvation, calling you to repentance, calling you to respond to the gospel.
And as everyone else leaves this place to go sow their seed, I ask you to come down to the front to talk to me and talk to our team to receive your seed today. Don't delay if you need to come to Jesus today. Let's stand together and let me pray. Lord, we need your help. Help us in this endeavor. Give us courage and strength and determination to be obedient and to go from this place and sow the seed of the gospel. Grow a harvest from us. I pray for your glory and your honor and for the sake of you, Lord Jesus, and it's in your name that we pray, amen.